All right. All right. Good morning, guys. I'm really excited. I got my friend Randy Smith on our podcast today. I was a guest on his wonderful podcast, The Gentle Art of Crushing It. And it dawned on me, let's have Randy on my podcast. He has so much to share. He's a very sharp guy and a good friend of mine. Randy, why don't you um, introduce yourself to our audience? Yeah, absolutely. First of all, thanks, Andrew, for having me on the podcast. It was a blast having you on mine as well. So if your listeners haven't listened to that one yet, they should jump on and listen because you brought just a ton of value there. So yeah, so I am, uh, I'm actually the co-founder of Impact Equity. I am, um, I actually am coming out of a 25 year career in business to business sales and sales leadership and, you know, fortune 100 and fortune 200 companies. And along that path, I found um, active investing in real estate by investing in some turnkey properties out of state. And then I did some Burr strategy out of state as well, and then found pretty quickly that I was not able to ramp up as quickly as I wanted to. And I was having to spend far too much time in the active space for far too little returns, which ultimately led me to passive investing in real estate through the syndication model. So um, over the last couple of years, I've invested, I think, in 18 deals now at this point, eight different operators, four different asset classes. And uh, I'm making this a full-time job since leaving my W-2 earlier this year. Oh, that's really wonderful. You know, Randy, we often talk of in syndication that there's um, you know different roles on the team. And I know in talking with you and other people, you know, you quickly realize you know, what what is my superpower and you know what value I can bring to the table. And and everybody should learn underwriting, but generally speaking, we're gonna let one person on the team be the specialist to you know dive yeah. deeply into the underwriting, but you want to understand what is your superpower, Randy? Yeah, and I, I like that terminology as well. I remember when I first heard that in this space, I felt a little odd talking about that. But <laughs> at the end of the day, we do all have a superpower. And with my background in sales and sales leadership, it is influence, it is networking, it is um, you know sales primarily, which really ties nicely to a couple of pieces in the syndication model. One would probably be, broker relationships or deal finding. Um, but then a second one would probably, and this is actually the one that I focus on is investor relations or bringing dollars to the table or, or helping investors find great deals. So my superpower is capital raising, investor relations, relationships with investors. That's wonderful, Ray. It's you know, really important stuff. Um, what would you tell the, the newer um person to the space, you know, uh, you know, considering your journey, what's the best way for them to get the confidence to do what you've done? What, what did you learn along the way? Yeah, I think education uh, breeds confidence. So first and foremost, you have to become educated. But the thing that builds confidence even more is actually taking action and investing in that first deal. Um I spent I spent five years on the sidelines watching everybody play in the real estate space and was envious and wishing that I could take action. I used this crutch of my W-2 to tell me that, you know, I had to keep my focus on my W-2. But ultimately, uh, when, when I look at how far I came in just four or five years while I had a W-2, um, I wish I would have just started much, much sooner. And I think even if I had made a mistake on that first investment, which actually I ended up doing, I think, on the first one, um, I still would be much further down the road and could have actually left the W-2 or become work optional much faster than I did. Oh, wow. Well, that's great. I hope this inspires people that are listening that, you know, not to not, you know, not to have that imposter syndrome or to be overwhelmed by the process. Um, you know, a lot of people are able to do this it's not easy, but it's doable if you've got to put in the work, right? What yeah. are the what are the educational resources that I know you're really big on education? What are the educational resources you're um, keen on? And I understand that you know, different people have different learning paths, but what are the ones yeah. you you personally really like? Well, I I think ultimately the people you spend your time with, whether that be in person whether that be in books or podcast or education environments, but those people that you hang around with are really going to be 
probably the biggest indicator of your future direction and your future success. So if you want to be very, very good at investing in the stock market, hang out in corporate America and talk with people about the stock market and 401ks and IRAs, right? If you want to do more, if you want to go outside of that, the traditional investments, you got to get around people that are doing that stuff. Because if, if nine of your friends are in the stock market and you're the one guy talking about apartments, it's going to be really, really hard to make that jump. So um, get around the people, whether it be in meetups, podcasts, books, circles, whatever it is, you got to get around the people that are doing what you want to do. And I would definitely plug the general art of crushing it. You, you have a great um, lineup of guests, but more importantly, I, I like the way you do your questioning. I mean, you're really getting to the meat of the matter that, you know, that helps the viewer. Um, what, what are the questions you would say for the LPs that they're not asking the questions that they should be asking? Yeah. So for myself, um, like the first question, everybody talks about knowing what your goals are with your passive investing or, or whatever that is. But I did not have a good idea of what my goals or my strategy would be with my passive investing um, at all and, until I probably got into three or four deals at that point. We we hear people talking about growth versus cash flow and, and everybody talks about being cash flow investors. But as a high earning W2 guy, I was not a cash flow investor. In fact, I didn't want any more income on the front end. I was looking to grow my nest exactly. egg so I could step away. So um, really understanding on the specific investments are these growth opportunities or cash flow in in opportunities. And does that tie to what your overall goals are? Because myself, I was... I was a growth investor for the first year and a half, two years of my passive investing journey. I ended up leaving my W2, not by choice. It was it was a um, a layoff, big, large corporate layoff. My whole division was decimated. Yeah. And overnight, I became a cash flow investor um, because now all of a sudden I needed the monthly cash flow. So I think asking those questions up front and then probably the biggest one is... Um, you know, you say that the past performance doesn't isn't an indication of future success, but if people have been successful for a long period of time, it's highly likely they're going to find a way to get it get it done in the future. So, um, really, really digging into past performance, um, how they performed, what does their track record look like? Just, I think that single piece alone is the big, biggest indication of future success. I noticed well, one of the things that. I notice in talking with other LPs, in my personal experience, the, the stumbling block for us is we can identify a good deal, but it's the vetting process, the, the rigor that we put into it, the time that we put into it. Most people, when they, they're reflecting back on the beginning part of their LP journey, would have vetted, put more effort into the due diligence and vetting the team, yep. um, not just looking like, you know, is it does the deal look good? Um, do I like the underwriting? Do I like the market? But specifically vetting the team more diligently with more time and energy and taking that more to heart. Um, what would your advice be to a newer investor on how to better vet the team? Yeah, I think I think that is that is the money question, right? So how do we vet good from bad? I think um, so when I'm when I'm looking at operators, Actually, let me take a step back. So um, over my my career, 20, 25 years, sales, sales leadership, I was I spent about 12 to 12 to 15 years in leadership roles where I was constantly interviewing candidates. It was the it's like the thing you do forever. Oh. As if you have any amount of people that are working for you, you're always recruiting and always interviewing. So trying to trying to interview and find that ideal candidate for your role is basically what we're doing in this, in this uh, vetting process as well. I like so I spend a lot of time looking at the investor resume or the, the syndicator resume. And on this last process, as I was going through the vetting process, I'm looking at LinkedIn and, and kind of taking a look at it as like a sales manager. And I would say, okay, I see this period of time where you did this. I see a gap in your resume here. So what, what were you doing then? Um, and I see this on one website and this on another website, which conflict. 
So I, I want to understand the difference there and why we have some discrepancies in what you're doing. Because at the end of the day, if you're, um, it, it all comes down to me to integrity. And mm -hmm. I don't necessarily need the smartest guy in the world, but I want the guy who's going to show up and work hard for my money. And if ever there's a challenging situation that comes up, I want to know that he's going to act in my best interest and act with integrity. So if a guy is filling out a LinkedIn profile and he decides to fudge it just a little bit, uh, that to me is an indication to his integrity and how you do anything is how you do everything. So if, if you're willing to lie a little bit on a LinkedIn profile, you're probably willing to lie on something else as well. So, so I spend a lot of time on that kind of stuff. I think that um, something else that's really important. A lot of people think that, um, you know, you have to be in this space for 20 years or 10 years or been through three cycles or, or all of those different mantras that you hear out there. But I think my experience is a top performer is generally a top performer throughout their, like, uh, throughout their career, whether that be in the same role, different roles, whatever that is. But um, those skills that make you a top performer in one capacity will quite often translate over to syndication model as well. So if I see a group that has, you know, two to three to five years syndication experience, but I can see that they spent, you know, they went to great schools or they had great careers before coming into this space then that's important to me. You know, even simple little things like um, extracurriculars and things in their community and those types of things, like, like people carry those traits forward into the syndication business. And at the end of the day, this is just a business, um, mm -hmm. not, un not unlike every other business out there, right? We've got something that we're selling. Um, we need to show up with integrity. We need to work our butts off and provide a great solution. And that's all syndicators are doing. So, all right. We'll go right into the nitty gritty of details. Um, something I'm often guilty of not getting into that tend to talk high level and thematically. When, when an LP is looking specifically at a pitch deck, yeah. what are the components that if it's missing um, a certain piece of information, it's, it's kind of like a deal killer for you. So I'll, I'll give you an example, but I'll let you run with it. Like sure. for me, if, if, if there's not a slide that clearly delineates what the management fee is in terms of, you know, the property management fee, the acquisition fee and the disposition fee, that's, yeah. that's a note. That's a non-starter for me. I, yeah. I shouldn't have to ask. That's something you should be disclosing. I'm not saying that if you miss that slide, I'm not you know accusing you of malfeasance or something yeah. nefarious, but it's just, for me, that's just done. Like we're not, we're not doing business. A friend of mine had just sent me um, a pitch deck and said, hey, would you invest this? What do you think? And we ran through it and I, it just kind of dawned on me at the end of it, wait, we're missing a slide here. They never discussed fees. There was yeah. somewhere hidden in it, um, the acquisition amount fee. And then you had to backtrace it against the um, the, the total raise. And then you, you could figure out the acquisition fee. And I'm like, look, this is not going to be a good relationship for this individual, sure. not for me either. We shouldn't have to be figuring out fees. And if the other stuff's not disclosed, like it's just, to me, it's just a trust issue. It's like, we're done. There's too many other deals out there. What, what would be the things in a pitch deck that if it were missing, you would be, or the number was so out of line with, you know, the general, you know, asset class norm that you would say, look, yeah. look, a Fred, my friend, Fred, you know, my cousin, Fred, no, no, don't invest in this deal. There's just, there's just other deals out there. This isn't how business should be conducted what what would it be for you yeah so first of all i agree with you like fees should be up front in your face we should know all about it and and as an lp investor it's important to see that your syndication team is actually making money on this deal throughout the hold period uh, because i've seen far too many situations where they don't charge enough acquisition fee or they don't charge enough asset management fee and then they're starving and they've got to cut corners to try to make money some other how. And I I want, I, I actually had a leader at one of my last organizations that said, um, you know, when he was hiring me, they made an offer and it was actually more than I was expecting. Um, but they said, we, we want to take 
the money off the table. We want you to make the decision and do the work because it's the work you want to be doing, right? So let's make sure our syndicators are making some money, first of all. Oh, yeah. So let's not nickel and dime over yeah, yeah. one, two, three percent, that kind of stuff. If they're trying to hide it, then by all means, that's not good. So just as important that as that though is I think in a deck, um and and transparently, there's there are deck formats out there that if you've got $19.99, you can get a very well professionally drafted deck that you can put your own numbers in that have all the slides that you need to have. So um, if you don't have that and you don't have professionalism in your deck, I think that questions your um, ability to perform too. So all that being said, I think probably the most important thing, especially now with everything that's going on in the marketplace and the economy and the interest rates is I want to see stress tests. Yep. I want to see what happens when occupancy drops. I want to see what happens when you hit your rate cap. I want to see what happens if the interest rate goes above that after the, the caps fall off at the end of two or three years. Um, I want to see all of those stress tests. I want to see stress tests if you're not able to hit your performer rents. I want to see all of those variables. What happens to my return if X, Y, and Z happen? I think because ultimately X, Y, and Z are going to happen and nothing's going to be down the center of the fairway. Um, so I think it's important to be prepared or at least know what that's going to do to my returns. I love that. That That's really great. And any GPs watching this, um, I, 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 you know, Randy and I look at quite a few pitch decks and I don't see as many deals that have sensitivity analysis within them. And if you're a GP watching this, please, you know, start putting in sensitivity analysis your LPs are really going to appreciate it. It's going to definitely differentiate you um, amongst the all you know the various deals that are out there. So many deals out there. And um, what is the last? I, actually, oh. Andrew, if you do you mind if I make one more comment real quick Please. in that regard? Absolutely. So one thing that I don't see with the sensitivity or stress tests is I would like to see a combination of variables and what that does to the returns. So what happens if occupancy goes down? Um, we don't hit our rents, interest rates, like let's throw a few different variables in there. So I can truly see what is a worst case scenario. Um, because quite often, a lot of those KPIs are going to be tied together. So mm -hmm. if we're not hitting our numbers and the interest rates fluctuate and all of those things happen, like what's going to happen to the deal versus everything stays perfect, except one of those variables, you know, that's a great, that's a great point. That's a really good point. Um, in the interest of time, I just want to wrap up, but I wanted to uh, yeah. make sure we, you know, we offer this up to you. What, what, what is the last thing you would want to add to um, LPs that are looking to invest or they're newer in their journey of investing? What is the last, you know, Randy Smith piece of advice you'd want to give out? Yeah, so I think something that that's really important in all investing is diversification. So. Um, I am I am not of the mindset of put all of my eggs in one basket and watch the basket closely. I am in the mindset of diversifying. I like to diversify across operators, deals, asset classes, and even deals within, like if I find an operator that I absolutely love, I think it's better for me to put 25 grand in four deals than it is to put a hundred grand in one deal. So um, everybody has home runs but everybody has dogs too. And I don't want to, I don't want to put my hundred grand in a dog when the next deal could have been that home run. So I think you should spread the money over many, many deals, operators, geographies, asset classes. Yeah, I would definitely agree with you on that one, especially for um, the beginning and in, uh, LP investor that don't rush off and, you know, cut a huge check um, to just to one syndicator and one asset class on one deal. Um, yeah. You know, you, Perhaps, you know, someone just sold the house, like a big you know investment property, and now they're sitting on this huge pile of money. You know, slow down, take your time, you know, really interview several people. And, you know, I would just like Randy was saying, I would say spread, spread it out over over a couple different asset classes and, and vendors. That That's great advice, Randy. Really appreciate you coming on the, the uh, podcast, Randy. We'll have to do this again because um, you have so much knowledge to share with people. I just wanted to keep it in a digestible chunk for everybody. Yeah, no, I appreciate it. I love what you're doing. Um, love your mind around this space as well. You're a super, super smart guy. 
Um, so it's really, really neat to hear your perspective as well with all the content you put out. So thank you. Well, thank you, Randy. And anybody uh, out there, definitely remember the general art of crushing it. It's a wonderful podcast. I've been a guest and I, I was genuinely, uh, sincerely appreciative of the, the level of questioning that Randy does. He puts a lot of time into getting to know his guests to ask really good questions. He doesn't just wing it. It's not a formula of questions. He, Randy really puts the time into to be a great podcaster. And it shows in everything you do that you, you really put your all into things, Randy. And I appreciate that about you. So thanks again. And uh, we'll, we'll have you back on the podcast someday in the future, buddy. Awesome. Thanks, thanks everybody.